having to sit through this. Okay, back in. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the May edition of the Textile of the Month Club. I'm John Marshall, and today we'll be talking about Oshima Tsumugi and a slight variation towards the end of it. So let's see, let me see if I can get this right this time. Okay. All righty, here we're ready to go now. Um, so Oshima Tsumugi, Oshima is an island that will, I'll show you where it is in just a moment, but um, Tsumugi actually is talking about the spin of a yarn, okay, a slub type yarn, but in this case, when you say Oshima Tsumugi, usually you mean ikat, okay, kasuri type of fabric. And so there are many kinds of kasuri that I'm sure you're familiar with. The picture on the left is egasuri, a type of patterned uh, pictorial uh, kasuri. And the details in both the previous slide and this one show you the tiny resisted areas um, that keep the dye from dyeing that area, coloring that area. So here you see the little sections knotted off. And here's a fellow dotting the warp threads in bundles Okay, so you do dye many, you'll be dyeing many threads of the same pattern at the same time. And here he is actually going about this. So this again is for the warp. And so the bundle he's tying will be one warp thread pattern, but he's tying many of them at the same time. So those warp threads will be distributed across the loom. And then of course, you'll have other warp threads tied differently. And eventually once dyed, those will all line up to create the pattern he's after. Now, when it comes to the weft thread, you can plan them a little bit differently. And here you can see that she's tying them off with the loom sort of fake um, prepared so that she can tie a bundle at a time. Now, there are other kinds. That's the kasuri we talked about is probably what comes to mind when most people think of ikat, but there are other varieties of it. One variety is called meisen, which is actually a silk screen type of ikat. What happens is the entire warp thread is laid out on a table, it's silk screened, and then picked up and placed on the loom. And of course, the same is done with the weft thread, if there's a weft pattern to it, if it's a warp weft ikat, and then those two are coordinated. This allows for a little bit speedier process. And so this is an example from my collection of uh, one of these. The label that came with it indicates that this person is a traditional mason dyer, um, an ecot dyer, and this was an award that was received, a cert certification that was received as part of this piece when it was prepared. So where exactly is Oshima? So here's Japan relative to the rest of the globe, and if we zoom in on that a bit, you'll see that uh, Oshima, let me stop here just a minute, you'll see that Oshima is um, just about, let me back up just a spec there. Let's see, can I do that? Yeah, okay. So you'll see that Oshima is just about equidistant to Japan, Korea, and China. Okay, and then right down here is Okinawa, all right? So that just gives you a sense of where it's placed in the tropics. And as you can see, it is a very tropical island with very beautiful oceans around it, nice uh, tropical plants. It's very similar culture to Okinawan in some ways. When and there are unique plants that grow there too, such as this particular tree, um, Oshima, traditional Oshima uses natural dyes, but beyond the dye itself, there's something else that's quite important, and that's the mud. So this is actually a mud dyeing, a type of dorozome, a mud dyeing process. And the way the mud works is once you've dyed the yarn itself, you know, the color is attached, but like many plants, it still needs a mordant. And rather than adding a synthetic mordant or you know, some other process, they take it and will bury it in the mud. And the mud contains many minerals, and those minerals become your mordant. So let's take a look. So here they are chipping up the wood in preparation to cooking it to make the dye. 
Okay, so you're going to go ahead and heat up the dye and cook it as you would any other vegetable dye. Go ahead and thoroughly saturate the fibers in this and then take these dyed fibers over to the mud fields and swish them around there. One of the things you'll find if you, for this process, if you over knead the yarn, uh, you lose the ecot effect. So it's quite a skill to develop um, in terms of exactly how much you massage the yarn while it's in the mud or while it's in the dye. So of course they have to start with preparing the silk themselves from silkworms. These of course develop into the uh, cocoons themselves, which are then spun into the yarns. Now, even though tsumugi technically refers to a slub type yarn, you can see this is a filament yarn, very fine, very smooth fabric uh, is produced by it. So the first thing you do, you scour it thoroughly, then you go ahead and saturate it in a starch to make it stiffer for weaving. And they've, they're, in this slide, they've taken the starched thread and they're stretching it outside to allow it to dry evenly. That'll keep the tension even, keep it from sagging as you work with the yarn. It's nice to have a little bit of property to do this. And then of course, once the yarns are prepared, you do need to prepare your design. And so like many weaving patterns, the old way, you go ahead and create your you know, checks and circles and things for your boxes. Here are several typical patterns. You can see the repeat. And then the circle in the center shows you that pattern, the graph, the cartoon, translated into the actual finished woven piece. Look at how minute how very fine the detail is. That's a very difficult kind of detailing to achieve simply through time, okay? So Oshima Tsunugi Kasuri has a rather unique approach. I'm not aware of it being used anywhere else in the world except for this particular variety. What you'll do is you'll take your cartoon, your chart of threads, and I'm gonna stop here for a second. What you're looking at here is a cluster of threads, a bundle of threads, okay? And so the weaver is going to follow the pattern and you'll see down below here how it follows very closely the particular line that's being worked on. Now there's a thicker thread going across it that's spacing them. Okay, that thicker thread you'll see is what actually produces the, the resist. And so in this case, this is the thick thread going, whoops, let me back up just a spec here. The thick thread is a very heavy cotton. The, up, the vertical ones that you're looking at are the very, very fine silk threads. I mentioned clusters of them. This little bundle, when it comes time to weave, isn't going to be woven, well, excuse me, isn't going to be woven as that bundle. It's dyed that way, but eventually each of those th strands will be separated apart and then combined with others to create the final weave. That'll become a bit more clear in just a moment. Okay, so here we see the loom set up and the weaver is about to, we'll show you how the heavier threads are used. The very heavy cotton is prepared on something that you could kind of uh, consider a shuttle, I suppose. Okay, and then on the right, you see the very heavy threads coming in. And from there, we'll go about making use of them. So here's the weaver preparing the silk yarns with the very heavy thread. Now, remember, the heavy cotton, which as we're looking at it is the weft, will be the resist. Okay, and what is positioned here is the warp will be the actual yarns we'll weave with later. And so one of the things that's necessary, of course, is I'm gonna, let me stop here just a minute. It's crucial to keep your selvage edge turnaround accurate because when you're dealing with very fine patterns, if it's off even a little bit, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse as you move along. So that's what we're looking at right here is the turnaround point of the yarn. And then, of course, double checking to make sure it's accurate with the cartoon. Uh, so I'm sort of um, belaboring this a bit. But again, these 
what we're seeing is the weft is the resist inducing yarn. It's the yarn that will keep areas of the silk from being dyed. The actual yarn that we'll be using later we're seeing is the warp here. Okay. And that's why it's spaced so oddly. Okay, so I'm going to back up just a tiny bit here to explain uh, something, okay, because I, quite frankly, I just realized it. Um, if you'll notice here, these bars that are inserted are separating out the various clusters of threads, okay? And so that's helping him to create spacing in the weave, spacing that will be large areas of color and not tiny resisted areas. Now, once done and taken off the loom, this is what it looks like. I know that looks very odd, but you'll see that each one of these hanging down parts is one cluster of weft threads in this case. Now, this video clip is a bit shaky. Um, it was the best one I was able to find, or actually the only one I was able to find. And what the craftsman here is explaining to the students is that each one of these sections the hanging down parts, represents one line, one segment of the weft thread. And they're attached this way to keep them in order. You don't want to get them out of order. So let's just say for the sake of argument that the first one represents the bottom half of the circle. The second one represents the imagery created by the middle of the circle, and the third one might be the top of the circle, okay? So those three lined up properly as you're woven gives you the image that you need. Now, again, those are in bundles. So in any given hanging down section, you might have, say, 50 strands, and that the three segments together allow you to do 50 repeats as you weave. Okay, we'll see that more of that in just a second. So you can see he's lining those up with the cartoon, explaining how each one is a different portion of the finished weave. Now, this is an aside, okay? So we're not talking about traditional dyeing now. We're just talking about something I came across that I thought was a really interesting innovation. So in this case, what you're looking at is one of those hanging down segments, okay? And this particular artist with his fingers and nails dyed blue from the indigo is going along and adding color selectively using this little squeeze tube. So rather than dipping the whole thing as dyeing in the dye, as we'll see in just a moment, he's actually just painting in between each of those heavy cotton threads. It's a really clever way to give you complete control over where and how you apply the color. So now going back to our traditional method, okay. Um, here you see some of the wood again prepared. You can see the coloring is going to come from the center itself. By the way, if in, I'm stopping again. If any of you happen to have flowering plum and have to trim the branches, um, they'll give you this very similar color. Okay, I do that with the plum in my yard. So go ahead, cut down your branches, chip them as you'll see them doing, cook them as you'll see them doing. You might not want to use mud, but you can add your mordants or not as required to get beautiful color. So many trees, many woody um, material will give you beautiful colors like this. And here you see them going about preparing it. So they've cooked up their dye. They're taking that whole bundle of um, weft pattern threads, dyeing them all together. Again, you can't over squeeze them or you'll be forcing the dye in between the heavy cotton areas, which you don't want to do. But you need to do it enough to make sure it penetrates. So that's always a matter of skill. This uh, person now is taking that dye applied yarn and now mordanting it in the mud. And here again, he's pounding it, he's working it enough to work the minerals in the mud into the dye, but not so much as to make it wick beyond the resisting thread. And this is pretty much what it looks like. The reason for the difference in color is that the cotton resist is taking the color differently than the silk strands. 
Okay. And so here he is again, finishing up. Now, the more times you dip it, the more times you repeat the process, the darker the yarn will become, as with any other type of natural dyeing you might do. Um, very pale colors are usually five or six dippings. Very dark ones can be dozens upon dozens of dippings to get the deep, rich colors. Now, here you see, let me stop again. This, <coughs> excuse me, this lower section is the bundle we've talked about. Now, when you go back and pick it apart, what you see, this is the dyed strand and these little bands on it are where this very heavy cotton has not allowed the dye to penetrate because you beat it so tightly, okay? And that's what's creating your pattern. You can see this might be a little bit more efficiently than going along and tying each little individual section by itself. So here she's picking them apart. And so you can see there's each cluster, the bundle that was woven as a thicker yarn. And this is what you get. This is that bundle. Again, this is not one pattern. It's many, many of the same pattern clustered together. And if you go and pick all of these apart, now that you've done all that work, you'll see what a fine, fine, minute pattern you've achieved. And in the case of the warp, you go ahead and stretch this all out and get it prepared to uh, reel up for the loom. And here are your bundles of threads. This is the kind of loom that would be used. Okay, and now here's a weaver preparing her yarn and it's really incumbent upon the dyer to do accurate work or the, the person initially weaving to put the resist in. But even at that, there's some variation that you know, uh, introduces itself. So it's also incumbent upon the weaver to accurately, constantly pick at the yarns, monitor the yarns, look for control, adjust as they go along in order to keep everything lined up precise, precisely. And of course, along the way, warp threads get broken. And so usually the weaver will have a cluster of additional patterned pieces that she can tie in. And that's a lot easier when it's a small repeat than if it's a large pictorial pattern as the um, Hiroshige print reproduction that I showed you earlier. Okay, and again, picking just to make sure everything's in there. Both warp and weft have to line up, of course. And then, of course, you get to the final stage where you cut it off. Um, usually when they're um, dyeing the warp, they do enough for six bolts of fabric at one time. Okay, and so again, you can see that speeds up the process in terms of a manufacturer from a production point of view. So this is, um, I mentioned I'd be sending you an additional sample this month. And this is an example. This is the piece I'll be sending you. Um, the writing on it says, Oshima Tsumugi. Okay, and so again, that's the type of dye that we're talking about. And a detail of it will show you all this tiny, minute intersections of pattern and color. So again, this is the sample that was actually in your collection this month. And on the surface, it might not appear to be Oshima based on what we've discussed. But um, the writing at the end of the bolt does say Oshima, Oshima Kasuri Ori Kumi, uh, um, Oshima Kasuri Ori Kumi, uh, Fukuro Obi. Okay, so it was intended to be a Fukuro Obi. And it has this additional um, uh, Ori Kundaru um supplemental weft to it and here you see the blue yarns is a supplemental weft but the detail now is showing you the actual oshima section of it okay these are the little resisted sections and then on the surface is also the um, twisted gold yarn threads this is the back so that, that takes care of the bulk of what we're talking about for today's presentation. But I wanted to show you some other absolutely exquisite Oshima pieces from my collection. 
And this gives you some of the detailing and shows you um, the splendor. Now, quite often, Osima is, as I said, mud dyeing, but other types of dyes are also used in the same process. There are other islands around that do Osima, like Amami Oshima and different regional ones that still use the same technique. Uh, usually when you say Oshima, you are referring to that weaving resist technique. And these samples give you at least a vague idea of the kind of detailing and exquisite patterning and range of colors also that can be achieved. Okay, so thank you for listening today. Um, these video clips that I've used, I do take from various Japanese web pages. So I'll list links to the original sites uh, at the bottom of uh, our page on YouTube. And so please do go ahead and visit them. You'll get a broader range of information and um, also support them in their efforts to 